evidence that it'll do anything bad. There's a point to which it'll stop doing any more good, um, but there's no evidence that it'll do anything bad. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying it won't happen. I'm saying there's anything no evidence. Anything good for it. in terms of yield. Yeah, in terms of yield. Part of the good we're trying to implement here is the carbon sequestration. I think the overall story this is telling us is that one hand scratches the other in terms of, uh, in terms of carbon sequestration and uh, agronomic benefit. Um, there's no evidence that there's any clear um, places where you want to, where they're in conflict. Except, um, biochar might have more mitigation potential in the tropics rather than the temperate zone, in part because of obvious things, like the fact that there's higher plant production in the tropics and higher baseline turnover of soil carbon. So, you know, if you, if you bury wood chips in, uh, in a cool place, they'll be there for hundreds of years. If you bury wood chips in the Amazon, they won't. Um, so that's the obvious one, but the, the, the sort of less obvious one the study helps you get at is that um, adding higher temperature char to acidic soils will give more benefit than adding lower temperature char to acidic soils. Higher temperature char is going to be more recalcitrant than lower temperature char um, in a place where recalcitrance is the major pathway. Um, if you get a better yield from the higher temperature stuff, you're going to see more farmers adding the higher temperature stuff, all else equal. Um, maybe all else won't be equal, but if all else is indeed equal. So that's why I say that. Conversely, in the, uh, in the, in the temperate, um, biochar might have more mitigation sort of through the carbon negative biofuel pathway, given the agricultural preference might be for lower temperature chars than were in the tropics. Um, given the obvious things, lower FP, less feedstock, lower baseline turnover of soil organic carbon. Um, of course, not everywhere. You know, in the southeast, you'll get a lot of turnover very fast. Um, in other places, less so. Uh, lower temp lower temperature biochar offers more opportunity for diversion of pyrolysis gas and oil for producing energy. In places that produce energy from coal, you might get a better greenhouse gas benefit um, through gasification than you would through uh, through turning it into biochar. It, it just depends on contextual factors. Um, and yeah, like I say, mitigation potential will depend on greenhouse gas intensity of electricity grid. In terms of density, as far as farmers would be concerned, and how much they put in, my understanding is that the process of paralysis, depending on these stocks, around 30% biochar from what your original biomass. Slow pyrolysis, in terms of, uh, fast pyrolysis gives you a lot less than wow. slow. Okay. Um. So it's not an issue of you don't have enough per hectare to reach the higher level. It's, right. it's gonna, you're going to have to build it up over years. And so if you have a natural limiting factor just based on the fact that there's not enough biochar. In many cases, that'll be, in many places, that'll be the case. Um, you know, one, one could imagine that one would say, not produce all of one's char from all of one's own field, maybe get it from other places, maybe add it once every five years. You know, there's a million ways this could be actually implemented in practice. And you know, I, I'm not speaking on any of those. I don't, I don't, I'm not a farmer. Because, so essentially, um, go back to. Uh, also, when you, you know, stay low and high, that's, that doesn't really have to be an explanation of the So, so low and high are, are indeed relative in this case. Um, I, I, th I think the lowest thing that anybody could really call, I mean, you know, these are hand wavy things, and nobody's, IBI is working right now on characterization and get, getting standardized definitions, which is important. Um, but, uh, you know, I think when I say low, I mean like below 450. When I say high, I mean above 550. Um, and so you're, why are you saying you can harvest more energy from the low temperature than the high temperature Because um, when, uh, when, you, when you take biomass and you pyrolyze it, you start heating it and the flammable gases come off. In most uh, systems, um, those flammable gases are then recombusted to provide the heat to drive pyrolysis. Or those flammable gases can be diverted, burnt elsewhere for other purposes. That's why. So if you're going to, if you're going to, if you only need to produce char at 350, then all that extra pyrolysis gas can go elsewhere and burn for economic purposes. If you recycle all of the pyrolysis, if you have a relatively efficient system and you recycle all the pyrolysis gases into that heat from them, into the, into the further baking of the char, you're going to get a really high temperature char. Uh, I 
I, I wonder about that because you produce a lot more pyrolysis gas as you raise the temperature, but the heat capacity of char is very low. So the energy required to raise the temperature of char is you can neglect. Hmm. Uh, the energy in, in that effort goes into volatilizing uh, the volatiles. And so I think what you see is you raise the temperature of char, you get a much higher yield of energy out of the char. To what point, though? I mean, you Where know, the energy is going. So low temperature sure, charge but I mean, don't, don't don't produce as much um, energy. But the energy isn't actually going into raising the temperature of the char. The energy is going into volatilizing the. With the low temperature char, you're going to have volatile matter left in the char. Then you could have gotten. If you've got. Well, I think I think I think I think I think that there's a. I wish I had a whiteboard here, um, but. Uh, from what I've seen, and again, I'm not, I'm not a chemical engineer, but from what I've seen is that, um, let's say that this is, uh, let's say that this is temperature, let's say that this is temperature, and let's say that this is, anyway, let, I'll, I'll just talk. Um, the, uh, you start getting volatile, you start getting flammable gases. You start getting these guys at, um, you know, 220 or so, 250, and in my own experience, you don't get a whole lot more of these once you get up to 500. Um, at higher production temperatures, you're spending all of your all of that energy. It's not driving off volatiles. What it's doing is it's going from this to that to that. Time is another factor. Time is another factor. Again, this this study can't get at the details of, of, of different pyrolysis modes, and they're they're very important. Um, so you're saying the energy is being consumed. By energy is consumed by making these high. By reorganizing. By reorganizing aromatic structures, it takes a lot of energy to produce diamonds, and we're not even getting to diamonds. But you know, I guess I'm curious. I would have envisioned those as exothermal. They're not reorganization. No, turning, making graphite is 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 endothermal. Is it? Yeah. Please. Yeah, I would. I think I think the data that I've seen indicate that that 80 percent or so of the gases that are going to be driven off are, are driven off by about 300 degrees. Right. Exactly. After, after that, you're just doing molecular But that molecular rearrangement is very important for, for chemical properties that you put into the soil and for recalcitrance of the carbon. So just looking at the structural diagram here, the, between the low temperature and the high temperature, it's still between the 4 and 800, which is still a semi-amorphous structure. And that's what you want for biochar, right? Right, right, right. It's just a matter of, you know, you know, one of, one of the... So okay, adding one graphite of the, to the soil isn't going to do anything, basically. I, I don't think anybody's ever tried it, but... Uh, <laughs> Pencils everywhere. Yeah, right, right, right. One of the, uh, one of, one of the co-authors on this paper, um, uh, a guy named Michael Schmidt, um, great name, it's a shame he's European, because uh, it's like, oh, Michael Schmidt, baseball player. But, um, but... Uh, he has a great slide where he talks about different kinds of biochar, and it's, a, it's the cover of consumer reports where they're comparing toasters. Um, and you know, there's the burnt toast, and there's the lightly burnt toast, and there's the toast that's not burnt at all. And it's, it's, it's a really apt analogy for biochar because a lot of stuff just isn't biochar. It's black, it doesn't mean it's charcoal. Um, and you call it that because, I don't know, maybe you get higher, it's not as, it's less, it's, it's, it's denser when you bake it less, or use more of the energy for, for, for because that's your value, and you don't want to put the energy back into the char. I mean, I think you know the stuff that IBI is doing on characterization is critical, and I really hope that they settle on some minimum temperature for biochar. Because you know, there's evidence that a lot of a lot of the work on the chemical recalcitrance of biochar has come from ecologists and biogeochemists studying uh, the effect of wildfire on ecosystems, and what they're they're really interested in the mean residence time of of the um, of the wildfire charcoal and soil. And you know, when there's a wildfire, you combust most of it and only a small fraction goes into uh, the charcoal type structure, they find it doesn't last that long. It's not much different from other types of um, other types of uh, other types of organic matter. Um, and if what if if we don't know, but if wildfire char is, can be compared to low temperature biochar, you're not gonna get a whole lot of sequestration benefit out of it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks.
Yeah. 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 Uh, hard to say because I'm doing a lot of other things at the same time. I'm still taking courses. So if I was not doing that, maybe a lot faster. When did you first start?